Excellencies, ministers, and dear friends, I would like to thank President Adesina for inviting me to take part in the discussions today. The African Development Bank's annual meetings are taking place at a critical moment for Africa and for the world. More than ever, we must all come together to end the pandemic and secure the recovery. Africa is now facing the world's fastest growth rate for new COVID cases with an exponential trajectory even more alarming than during the second wave in January. We fear that based on current trends, this way will likely surpass previous peaks uh, within the next weeks. It is a human tragedy and an economic calamity. Countries across the continent from South Africa to Uganda and Rwanda are forced to reintroduce restrictions further denting a precarious recovery. In the face of new variants, Africa is ill-protected due to severe vaccine shortages. So far, as you know very well, only 0.6% of Africa's adult population have been fully vaccinated. The warning signs are clear. A two-track pandemic is leading to a two-track recovery. Africa is already falling behind in terms of growth prospects. This year, we project the global economy to grow by 6%, but only have that 3.2% in Africa. This ought to change for the sake of Africa and for the benefit of the world. Africa can and must grow 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 percent, twice what the rest of the world, so it can catch up and fulfill the aspirations of its people. It can do that. It requires, of course, actions in Africa, but it also requires international cooperation on multiple fronts. First, step up international cooperation to end the pandemic. Uh, our staff recently proposed a $50 billion plan that involves vaccinating at least 40% of the population of all countries by the end of this year, and at least 60% by mid-2022. This $50 billion price tag is dwarfed by the estimated $9 trillion boost to global economic activity by 2025 from faster vaccine rollout and faster recovery. It would be the best public investment in our lifetimes. And it would be a game changer for Africa. Together with the World Bank, WHO and WTO, we are forming a war room a task force to monitor and accelerate the implementation of this plan. I am encouraged by pledges for vaccine support from international partners, including 1 billion doses announced at the G7 summit. I strongly support efforts to diversify vaccine production on the continent. And I commend the African Development Bank and the African Union for providing vital support, for providing leadership, including through rapid response facilities and vaccine procurement, and bringing Africa and the world together to act. At the IMF, we are also working on deploying our financing instruments to ensure that health systems have the capacity to save lives and secure the recovery. Second, help Africa deal with the growing mountain of debt. Debt levels, which were already elevated before the pandemic, have increased sharply, not surprisingly. Public debt in Sub-Saharan Africa jumped by more than six percentage points to 58% of GDP in 2020, the highest level in almost two decades. Interest payments last year reached 20% of tax revenue for the region as a whole and exceeded one third of revenues in some countries. Similarly, public debt in North Africa rose by about 12 percentage points 
to an average of 88% of GDP last year with the same consequences. To help safeguard that sustainability, the world has stepped up. The IMF has provided debt service relief to its poorest members. And together with the World Bank, we advocated for the G20 debt service suspension initiative, as well as for the common framework for debt resolution designed to provide deeper debt relief to countries with higher debt vulnerabilities. Thanks to the joint efforts of our members, we have reached two historic milestones. Last year, Somalia received debt relief under the enhanced keeping decision point and is now benefiting uh, from international financing, uh, including from the IMF. And today, Sudan is on the same path. And I want to recognize all African governments that have stepped up in solidarity, both with Somalia and Sudan. The DSSI has produced much needed breeding space and it has been extended until the end of this year. Now is the time to make the common framework fully operational. There are three countries that have asked for that treatment under the uh, framework, Chad, Ethiopia, and Zambia. And I'm encouraged that Chad recently received financing assurances from its G20 bilateral creditors. In other words, we are on the right track. We now need speedy commitments on comparable terms, especially by private creditors. And we want to always make sure that other official bilateral creditors are in. Why is this so important? Because successful implementation of the common framework in the first cases under consideration is critical for other countries with unsustainable debt levels to step up, to seek early action for debt resolution. This is particularly important in light of strong growth in the developed world, especially in the United States, and the likelihood of gradual monetary policy normalization that could increase the cost of that service over the next uh, years. Third, the international community can help strengthen Africa's recovery and resilience. Well, clearly the best way to deal with that, and many, many have spoken about it, is for economies to grow. This is not an easy task during the pandemic when governments face reduce revenues and increase spending on crisis measures. But this crisis is an opportunity for transformative reforms, to improve public finances, to strengthen governance, to deal with leakages from uh, what uh, tax authorities are uh, to collect. Think of how digitalization can improve tax administration and revenue collection and the quality of public spending. With radical transparency, Africa can tap into new sources of finance. Uh, let, me, let me just frame one that is so important, carbon offsets. And there is room to encourage more private investment in social and physical infrastructure. As noted at the G7 summit, development financing institutions and multilateral partners intend to invest at least $80 billion into the private sector in Africa over the next five years. And the G20 Compact with Africa remains a key framework to enhance the business environment in Africa, make it more attractive. Now is the time to expand and strengthen this initiative. We also need to modernize international taxation. We see growing support for a global minimum corporate tax which can end the race to the bottom and reduce tax avoidance. We welcome international efforts on digital taxation, very promising source of revenues if it is done right. It would help ensure fairer distribution of tax revenues and it will help address Africa's significant financing needs. At the IMF, we are doing our part. We swiftly ramped up our financing for the continent, including by providing in one year, 13 times our average annual lending to Sub-Saharan Africa. 
we have received support to increase access limits so we can scale up our zero interest lending capacity. And as we speak, our executive board, board is discussing the successful completion of Egypt's standby arrangements. Great example uh, where the IMF has provided significant support, $8 billion, to help Egypt address its pandemic related financing needs and safeguard that sustainability.